We have this incredible promotion, and it is the title of our sermon today, that we are invited to know God as our Father. Our Father. And to pray to God as his child. That's the invitation and the sermon title today. Our Father, pray as his child. We're going to be turning to two passages of scripture. The first on which we've been focusing, I'm just advancing as one word, in uh, Luke chapter 11, uh, verse 2 today. So we'll read verse 1 in the first two parts now, verse 2. And then also turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. The Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Rome, to the Christians in Rome, to the church in Rome. Hear now God's word, first from Luke chapter 11, verse 1 and the first two segments of verse 2. Now it came to pass, he was in a certain place praying. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you, and this is plural, when y'all pray, say, Father. Then to Romans chapter 8, picking up at verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. Literally, the Greek here is sonship. By whom we cry, Abba, and Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with or to our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. This past week, Thursday, we had a great celebration, giving thanks for the lives and the faith of Dero and Adelaide Ramsey. Oftentimes in funeral services, memorial services, services celebrating the resurrection of Christ and our our eternal home with the risen Lord Jesus, we turn to John chapter 14. And in John chapter 14, Jesus assures us that in the Father's house are many rooms and that Jesus goes to prepare a place for us. And then Jesus famously answering a question from Thomas who says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We've also, as we've been reading through Luke's gospel, I highlighted and we really focused on the fact that in Luke chapter 10, Jesus has this incredible Thanksgiving doxology prayer to the Father. And as we read in Luke chapter 10, verse 22, Jesus says this, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son and whomever the Son chooses to reveal him. So in other words, no one knows the Father, knows who the Father is, unless Jesus, the Son, chooses to make that revelation known to the person so they can come into relationship with God the Father. So as I mentioned, we read John chapter 14, verse 6 at a lot of funerals, but what about for you and for me now? If you're not planning to die this afternoon, how is it that Jesus is going to bring you to the Father now, on this day, and on tomorrow, if God gives you another day to live? How does Jesus bring us to the Father? The main way Jesus referred to God, called on God, and related to God was as what? Can you fill in the blank? As Fill in the blank. Father. As my father, as our father. 
Jesus referred to God, called on God, talked about God, prayed to God as Father. And here's the gospel. It's Trinity Sunday, so I'm being Trinitarian at various points here. So you can catch this, and it's really important to understand our relationship with God and the gospel, what it means to be a Christian. Jesus, the Son, invites us into his family and into his prayer life with his Father, Son, the Father. The Son invites us in to prayer life and to life right now with his Father who is now our Father. This is an astounding, radical, revolutionary message from the New Testament. God is our Father through Jesus Christ. How does that happen? When we are one, when we're united with Jesus the Son, well, how does that happen? By the Holy Spirit. So there you have the Trinity working out the gospel salvation for us and the relationship for us. So let me ask you this. What is a Christian? If someone said to you, hey, I know you go to church, what is a Christian? If your children said to you, mom, dad, granddad, I know we say we're Christians, is all that means is that we go to a church and kind of get dressed up and sing a couple songs? Is all that means that we kind of feel good about ourselves and kind of get revved up for the week? What is a Christian? J.I. Packer, arguably the most influential and significant and deep uh, theologian of the latter part of the 20th century, a Brit, you know, who, who went over to Canada uh, later and taught there. You've heard me talk about him a lot. He died uh, back uh, right during kind of the COVID period. <clears throat> Greatest theologian, late 20th century, and continued his work into the 21st century. He says, the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as Father. A Christian is somebody for whom God is their Father. He goes on and says this in Knowing God, you sum up the whole of the New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's Holy Father. This is radically different from Islam, I can tell you. Allah is not your Father that you have a relationship with, like father, child. It doesn't work that way. No other religion has this, this invitation and this incredible gospel revolution. Packer says further in Knowing God, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, and children, you can ask yourself this, is my mom or my dad actually understand Christianity? Find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and of having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and our focus right now in this little subseries, prayers, if having God as your father is not the focus of your prayers and the whole outlook that you have on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. It's a family relationship. It's a transformative relationship. And it's blessed assurance. See, Jesus lived and prayed in the truth that God was, always had been, is, and will be his father. How do you fill in that blank? Children, I don't know if we still talk this way, but if I said BFF, what does that mean? Best friend. What? Forever. You can fill in the blank. Jesus understood that God was, in the past, beyond time, forever his father, was in Jesus' earthly ministry his father forever, and would be into eternity his father forever. Nothing was going to take that away. Let me give you a few examples of Jesus turning to, and in some cases praying to, uh, God as his father in Luke, which we're working through right now, and I'll also give you one from Mark because it's so important. Jesus at the age of 12. You'll remember I really emphasized this when I preached on this. The first words that Jesus speaks publicly that are recorded in any gospel are where? It's when he's 12 
at the temple, and his parents realize they've left him behind and don't know what happened. They come back, and his mother says, what were you doing? You're, you know, you scared your dad and I to death. What was going on? And Jesus replies, his first words recorded in the gospel, directly from Jesus. And what are they about? His relationship with, well, I'm going to make a guess here. Here it is. Did you not know it is necessary for me to be where? In my father's house. This is right after Mary has said, did you not know your father and I were really concerned about you? Well, yeah, Joseph is his father, but who's his real father forever? Now, at Jesus' baptism, the prelude and intro to Jesus' public ministry. Luke 3, picking up at verse 21, Jesus is also baptized when the others are coming to John the Baptist to be baptized. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. This means the voice of the Father from heaven now. You... All right, this is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry now, the first time God speaks directly into the Gospels. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Jesus always, throughout his life and throughout his ministry, sought his Father's will, especially in crucible times, which we're called to do also, especially when we have big decisions, especially when we're highly concerned. Are you worried about something? Bring it to the Lord in crucible times, crying out to him. Not a mild little prayer, crying out to him. For instance, in Gethsemane, on the night before Jesus is crucified, right before Judas is going to betray him, Jesus has left Jerusalem, he's up the Mount of Olives, and he's praying and staying at Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane. He calls his disciples to pray, and then Jesus goes off, he kneels down, and what does he pray? What are the first words? Abba, Father. Abba, Father, remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. That's Mark 14, 36. Luke's version, 22, verse 42. Father, first word, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but thine be done. Okay, let's move forward to Jesus on the cross. His final words, his final prayer. In the ninth hour, which I told you in last Sunday's sermon, that's at the afternoon time of temple prayer. That's not insignificant, right? The ninth hour, in other words, right after three o'clock in the afternoon when Jesus is preparing to die, he says, it is finished, John tells us that, and then what does he pray? Jesus cried out. Get this crying out again, crying out. Here it is again, just like at Gethsemane. He cries out with a loud voice. Father. What's his first word? Father. And then he quotes Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Let me take you to Psalm 31. Did David refer to God as Father? No. Lord. Most high, into your hands I commit my spirit. But Jesus claims the verse and ratchets it up into his living relationship with God as his father. As Jesus dies, he claims Psalm 31 verse 5, but claims it personally within the Godhead family. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So here's New Testament salvation. New, te New Testament salvation, you want to know what it is? Faith in Jesus the Son. You've got to believe in Jesus the Son. Come to him. Believe in him. Faith in the Son. Rebirth or adoption by the Holy Spirit. As what? As children of God the Father. There's the gospel. This is all throughout the New Testament. The Apostle Paul certainly deals with this extensively in his letters, including Romans 8 and Galatians chapter 4. But let's go to John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Right off the bat in John's gospel, he puts it very clearly. But to all who did receive him, in other words, who, who received Jesus as the Son, who believed in his name, he gave the right to what? Become children of God, who were born not of blood, 
nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. There's the gospel. So here's what's going on in our faith and in our prayer life. This is incredible. Will you receive this? Will you live this out? Will you believe this? The Son calls you and me to come beside him in life and in prayer. And to trust in and pray to his Father, who is now our Father, through Christ. Obviously, we're not divine, but we're invited into the household now to come beside Jesus. And the Spirit unites us to Christ, transforming us by one degree to another, as Paul says, into the children of God. So, the spirit of adoption, or literally, it's sonship. I'll come back to that. That means like an heir, somebody who has a right in the inheritance. We us bears witness with or to our spirit that we are God's children. We're sons. Again, this doesn't mean just males. Okay, this is he's using Greco-Roman terminology and, and Roman law as to inheritance to make clear what's going on here. That's why he uses this this high form of son, which means a son who shares in the inheritance. That's the weos language that Paul is using here. We are God's children or God's sons, whether Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free. How? How is this possible? How does the Spirit assure us that we belong to God? Christian, here's a key on your faith life and definitely on your prayer life. The Spirit is not going to and does not assure you by leading us into self-absorption, navel-gazing. It's not about you <laughs> to begin with, okay? You don't want to start with you. It's critically important where you start, in your faith and in your prayer life. It's not about you. I know lots of writers and lots of popular speakers on the Christian circuit are all about, here's what I feel and here's what I thought and here was my little new insight. No, no, no. Not by leading us into self-absorption, but by leading us as God's word reveals in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. So let's break that down for a moment. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons. I've already explained that to you. That means heirs, okay? And let me just pull out for a minute and tell you. Under Roman law, for inheritance purposes, only a male could be adopted. So again, this is part of the reason Paul is using this language. A woman could not be adopted into true family position for inheritance purposes. And by the way, let me tell you this also. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, adoption is not there. People get brought into families, but there is no law of adoption. Okay? There's all kinds of other provisions under the law for taking care of people, but you don't get the adoption. In the Roman world, adoption into full family status was a big deal. You'll remember Julius Caesar famously adopted Octavian as who became Augustus Caesar, right? It's a big deal, okay? Tiberius ends up being adopted to, to be given the keys to the empire. That's what Paul is talking about here. Like, we, we, it's amazing. We are led by the Spirit. We are sons. We share in the inheritance, girls and boys, women and men now. For you have not received the spirit of bondage to fall back into fear. Am I in? Am I out? What's going on? No. But you received the spirit of adoption. Or again, as I've told you, this is literally in the Greek, sonship. By whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, I've just been driving down on a whole lot of Greco-Roman language and Roman culture. So I'll come back to this. This is really out of place, this Abba here. That's an Aramaic term. That's a Semitic term. But notice this. By whom we cry out by the, by the Holy Spirit, Abba and Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with or to. That's a disputed kind of, that's a nuance and a weeds thing that you don't need to get into today. The Spirit bears witness either with or to our spirit that we are God's children. Now, totally different term here now, techno. That's a general generic term for children, okay? And if children, then heirs. Theromanoi. Okay, that, that's a totally different term, too. So now we are talking about actual inheritance, right? 
heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, we receive the kingdom with Jesus. We are sure of the inheritance. Provided, catch this, this is where Paul is going in Romans chapter 8. Provided that we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. And then Paul immediately goes on to say, because we consider our present sufferings not worthy to be compared with the glory that will, will be revealed in us as sons or heirs of God. Okay? And we know that God works through all things for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes, etc. Nothing can separate us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 8. So this passage occurs in the midst of that conversation. Now, here, here's the way. Let's go back to Romans 8, 14 through 17 specifically, though. The Spirit assures us we belong to God by leading us, first of all, to hear and follow Christ the Son, that is to live by his spirit, according to his spirit, to suffer, Paul's big emphasis in Romans chapter 8, big emphasis here now, to suffer through his spirit and to bear fruit, including in the midst of our being persecuted as Christians, in the midst of this. And also then number two, the spirit leads us, we're not leading ourselves, the spirit is leading us in all this. The spirit leads us to cry out, in other words, to pray in faith, Abba, and Father. So let's recap this now. First of all, the Spirit is leading us to hear and follow Christ the Son, to live with Christ according to the Spirit, to suffer with Christ according to the Spirit, and to bear fruit according to the Spirit. And who is this? Who, who is this that has this relationship with Jesus that can pray Father? Well, let's look at what Jesus has already taught us in Luke's Gospel. For instance, in chapter 8, verse 21. My mother and my brothers, part of the, who's, who's in the family? My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Hear it and poeo, put it into practice, literally is what Jesus is saying. Actually, who keep hearing and hearkening to and obeying my word and putting it into practice in their lives. This then is who should call on God as father. Because Jesus tells us that's who's really in the family. Not people who put their names on a church roll somewhere. But I mean, actual who hear the word of God and do it. That's who's in the family, Jesus says. So Romans 8, 17. If children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Because people who actually hear God's word and do it, who are actually in the family, they're going to be in the family through thick and thin. They're not going to flail out. They're not going to choose the easy excuse and easy way out. So the Spirit then assures us that we belong to God by leading us to hear and follow Christ the Son and, secondly, to cry out, to pray in faith, Abba, Father. So here's the reality. People who are really going to cry out to God as Father are people who are going through challenges as Christians. If you're not being challenged in your Christian faith, if you just kind of are enjoying life, living life to the fullest, and seizing the day for yourself, you're not going to be crying out to God as Father very much. But if you're living for God, more and more you'll pray to him as God your Father. Christian prayer, this is what I take away from this, Christian prayer does not begin with our looking to ourselves but instead to our looking up to the Father, trusting in the Father and calling on our Father. It's, th this sounds simple, but it is huge and deep. Where does our prayer life begin? Well, I'm just worried about this, and I want to make sure of this. And then, no, no, no. no, no, no. It, you need to go to the Father first. You bring those things to him, and then you're going to circle back around. I'm going to trust you as Father. So... Back to Packer, because he was really tracking with, I remember that his thoughts and writing were consistent with what I was seeing in the scripture as I worked through it last week, and this is the case. He says this, Jesus' pattern prayer, which is both crutch, road, and walking lesson for the spiritually lame like ourselves, tells us to, get this, start with God. For God matters infinitely more than we do. <laughs> God matters infinitely more than we do. 
So back to my notes, I, I don't begin by looking to myself and asserting myself. Here's my laundry list, Santa Claus, you know, to my status, my house, my kids, my agenda, my family. It's all about me. And God, I hope you can work it out for me. No, no, no. Jesus does not teach us to begin praying this way. I am a child of God. Is that the way he starts the Lord's Prayer? I am a child of God. No. Instead, Jesus teaches us to begin this way. We look up to our Father. We give ourselves to our Father. And we pray to our Father. You see the difference? I don't begin with my ideas or emotions. I begin with the one who is also the end. As we say, our chief end is to glorify God, okay? I begin with the one who is the end, the goal, the God, the love of my prayer, my faith, and my life. I look up and give myself to our Father. Notice, Jesus did not pray this way. Remove this cup from me. From me. Father, that's not the way he prays at Gethsemane. It's the other way around. Instead, Jesus prayed first, Abba, Father. Then he asked, remove this cup from me, and then he circles back around. You hear this? Yet not what I will, but what you will, Father. I trust you. I belong to you. Let me pull back and just give you a little bit on the Abba. It's Aramaic, as I've already mentioned. And it's really out of place because Paul is using all these Greco-Roman terms. He's writing in Greek, and Paul usually does not use Aramaic. I can tell you this. Paul does not, very ran, rarely uses Aramaic. And then it pops up right there in the, the central point about the assurance of our faith and how we pray. What's going on there? Well, in brief, I think it's clear that Paul understands that three decades after Jesus' own you know, prayer at Gethsemane, the early Christians in Rome know this prayer. They know the words and the prayer Jesus uses because it's critically essential to being a Christian and being a minority persecuted Christian in Rome. Again, these are mostly Gentiles. They're mostly in Rome. They're not walking around speaking Aramaic. Most of them don't know Aramaic. So what's going on? Well, at the core and at the nub of their teaching and their understanding about being Christians, they understand that Jesus cried out, including in the crucibles, to God in Jesus' heart language, which is Aramaic, Abba. They know that. Number two, as we saw last week, and as I told you last week in last week's sermon, in the Didache, which is the earliest extra-biblical non-New Testament writing that we have, arguably, you know, heading into the end of the first century, end of, uh, beginning of the second century, the Didache teaches Christians to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. They are focused on the Lord's Prayer, right? And they know that it connects back to the way Jesus teaches us to start out with, connects back to the way he always called personally to his father, Abba. So reading between the lines, it's clear. Paul popping this out and saying, look, the Holy Spirit, the reason you call on God in the crucibles, even calling him by a word you would normally use in another language, as you know your Lord and Master used, Abba, means that the, the Spirit is speaking to your heart. That's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 8 as well as Galatians 4. Now, let me just say this on this father thing. Uh, in the Old Testament, the main words that are used for God are not father. Father is used by analogy 10, 11, 12 times in the Old Testament. By analogy, by metaphor, by simile. For instance, I'm studying Deuteronomy in my Sunday school class right now. And you know, chapter 1 begins early on. It says that God carried Israel like a father carries a son. Okay? Uh, again, in Deuteronomy 14, we get this reference to we are God's, you know, as Israel. We are God's child. You have this periodically appearing, but it's totally secondary in the Old Testament. And in no case in the Old Testament do you get personal address and prayer life coming before God and calling him Father. You call him Adonai, you call him Yahweh, you call him the Ancient of Days. You don't call him Father like that. You certainly don't call him, in the Hebrew it would be Av, and then now in the modern Hebrew they've adopted the uh, Aramaic Abba. You don't have that. But Jesus' main emphasis, what's the main way Jesus refers to God? 
totally flipping, flipping the script here. You've got to catch this. His father. My father. What's the main way Jesus addresses God in prayer? Ancient of days? Adonai? No. Abba and Father. And so Jesus is inviting us into this. And let me tell you, this is both personal and intimate, but it's also fancy word, eschatological. He's calling us in to understand that when he comes, when Jesus came, he ushers in the kingdom of God and the end times have already begun. We're already on the verge of what is to come, the age to come, and Jesus is inviting us to pray in that trust when he uses that language in his own prayers and then invites us into it. If you truly believe in Jesus, if you're going to go through the crucible and trust in him and be faithful unto him, you are already in the kingdom. Jesus is saying, so pray like it. And let me tell you this too, you'll read a lot of Christian commentaries, I mean not by like scholars, but like people who publish a whole lot of books that most people buy, and like women's teaching and men's teaching, and they'll tell you, and preachers say this a lot of times, well, Abba is like da-da, just like a little baby says da-da. And yeah, it's true that in Semitic languages, a lot of you know, young children, some of their first words are Abba, but that's not the way Jesus is using it. He's using it as intimate and personal and as reverent and adoring and obedient language. In other words, if I'm going to commit to God as Abba, I'm going to trust him. And that's the way Jesus uses Abba. So please disregard all those kind of bad teachings and sermons that you heard. That, well, this is just kind of baby language. It's a lot more than baby language. Jesus is not saying da-da as he dies on the cross. He's saying Abba. So back to this spirit of adoption bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children, not by leading us to self-absorption, but to cry out, truly to pray, Abba, Father. Now, I'm going to go back to Packer because he's so strong on this. I remembered this and went back to his knowing God this past week. Packer says, adoption is the highest privilege the gospel offers, higher even than justification. Now, why is he saying that? He says, yeah, yes, of course. Justification by faith is primary. As sinners, we much, must be saved. We're all under the judgment of God. He says, absolutely, it is essential. But then he goes on and says this, but contrast this now with adoption. Adoption is a family idea conceived in terms of love and viewing God as father. In adoption, God takes us into his family and his fellowship. He establishes us as his children and heirs. Closeness, affection, generosity are at the heart of the relationship. And then Packer says this, to be right with God, the judge is great, but to be loved and cared for by God our Father is greater. Isn't that awesome? That's what it means to be a Christian. So ask yourself, do I, as a Christian, understand myself, my real identity, my real future, my real destiny, that I'm a child of God. Do you? I want to invite you to understand who you are. If you believe in Jesus, you're invited all the way into this family, God's family. God is my father. Heaven is my home. And every day, I'm a little bit closer to my home. That's the way a Christian lives. That's what you believe. That's the way you pray. My Savior is, in a sense, my brother. I mean, he's divine. I'm not. But he's inviting me in as a co-heir with him. Say it every morning. Say it in the middle of the day when you're struggling. And say it at night when you go to bed. Trust that your home is with God. That you have full rights through Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit to belong to God forever. And your home and your eternity are secure in Jesus. That's what it means to pray, Father. And honestly, unless you can pray, our Father, from the bottom of your heart, you're not living in a relationship with Jesus. So I want to invite you in. He's calling you in to come alongside him and to look up to and to trust in God the Father first and all the way through to the end. When you pray, say, Father.
and salvation is sure in him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.